with me to Luke chapter 10. And as you're turning there, I want to, uh, first of all, somebody asked me last week, what was, that, what was that thing all about at the beginning? And if you didn't figure it out, I'll tell you, it's just the message that we're doing for the next three or four weeks. So you're going to see it again in case you didn't get it today and probably another time in case you didn't get it then. But uh, we're trying to push this concept out that what, what the Bible teaches about who the ministers are and how ministry ought to be done and how evangelism ought to be done. So uh, that's what that's about, a constant reminder for the next uh, two or three weeks as we're in this passage in Luke 10. The second thing I want to mention is uh, to encourage you to uh, see Jason and Nicole afterwards, find out what they're about. They're wonderful uh, young couple. By the way, in case you didn't know, uh, Nicole is Paul and Doris Lear's granddaughter. And uh, we were fortunate to get to know Paul and Doris for a while before they went to be with the Lord in heaven. Um, but uh, we're grateful to have her here for that reason as well as the ministry that God has given them. Secondly, I want to encourage you uh, about the baptism on the second. I hope you'll come and support those who are being baptized. If you're a believer and have never been baptized as a believer, you should be. This is the way the Bible teaches it. It's the only way the Bible ever presents people. Uh, they come to salvation and then they're baptized. It's the first expression, really, of the reality that's happened inside. And so uh, we have a great opportunity then. If you'd like to participate and never have, please let me know and we'll put you on the schedule. Uh, the last thing is, uh, and I, I, I hate to remake the announcements when I get up here, so I try not to do that most of the time, but I will push my brother one time only. Um, <laughs> he is a lot more interesting than I am. He's been a cop. He's got a lot of stories to tell. Uh, I hope I can keep him off family stories and on the cop stories, but... Uh, he will be here. It's a great opportunity to bring somebody who doesn't know the Lord because it'll be interesting, but there'll be a gospel presentation as part of that. And uh, so I hope, guys, you'll come. Now, a lot of ladies have asked me, well, how come we don't get to hear him? Well, you will meet him next Sunday morning, but we will, uh, uh, we will tape the Saturday morning uh, event so that you'll be able to look at that as well. If you're, some of you have read the book, I know, are interested to find out what he's really about. So you'll get an opportunity to do that. All right, we're in Luke 10. Would you stand with me as we read the first three verses of this chapter? After this, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them ahead of him, two by two, into every town and place where he himself was about to go. And he said to them, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, Pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Go your way. Behold, I am sending you out as lambs in the midst of wolves. Let's pray. Father, we are thankful for the word. We are anxious that your Holy Spirit teach us what it is you want us to hear and to understand from this word today. And then, Father, we want you to help us go put it into practice. We, what, what a privilege, Lord, to be part of this congregation. Uh, we're just, we're a group of flawed, imperfect people struggling in many cases to live the life that we know you're asking us to live or to let you live it through us. Lord, would you just help us? Help us together to encourage one another in the things that you desire, and we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Two, uh, this mother had two boys who were quite mischievous, ages 10 and 8. And a new pastor had come to town, and so she heard he was good with children. So she thought, I'll talk to him, see if he'll talk to the boys. He said, Sure. You just live down the street, send them down anytime, and I'll, and I'll talk to them. So mom got them all geared up one Saturday morning, sent them down to the church, and they arrived, and the pastor uh, said, I'll tell you what, I want to see the younger one first. So he took little Billy into his office. As he started to talk to him, he said, Billy, do you know where God is? And Billy's mouth just dropped open with shock and surprise. He didn't know what to say, he didn't say anything. And so the pastor gave him a moment, and then he said, 
well, son, do you, do, you know, do you know where God is? And Kenny just didn't know what to say. He said nothing. And so the pastor said, Billy, I want to know, do you, do you know where God is? And that was all he could take. He jumped up. He ran out of the building as fast as he could. He ran home. He ran through the door, slammed the door, ran into his closet. His brother was hot on his tail. He came in and he came into the closet with him. He said, Billy, what in the world happened? What's wrong? Billy said, well, I hate to tell you this, Jimmy, but God is missing. And they think we did it. Well, here's the truth, beloved. God is missing in a lot of lives, isn't he? God is missing in a lot of lives. And here's the question. Are we responsible? Are we missing what the Lord is asking us to do in sharing with friends and neighbors and family members and co-workers and those that we are around every day? missing the commission that he's given us to prepare the way for Christ. You know, in this passage of Scripture, as we began to look at it last week, we saw that as Jesus is getting closer to Jerusalem, he's anxious that people know the message. And so he, he not only is going himself, but now he's, first of all, sent his 12 out, and now he's sending 72 others out to go before him to prepare the way. And by application, this is a commission that we saw last week belongs to all of us, to every believer. Our reason for being is to prepare the way for Christ in the lives of other people. We have the opportunity, beloved, if God has left us here, to change somebody's world. And this passage of Scripture is dealing with that very Subject. Now, last week we looked at the commission. Verse 1 is kind of an introductory verse, and so we looked at that. Today I want to look at two more elements of this, which are the challenge of the commission, and then we'll look at the commands of the commission. The challenge is stated very succinctly in verse 2. The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. I didn't know that Jason was already going to quote that for us, but it was appropriate. The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. So the question is, well, who are the laborers and who is the harvest? The laborers are those like the 72 who are being commissioned to represent Christ. As believers, as we saw last week, this is all of us. Now, even with all of us who already know the Lord, it's a pretty small group, isn't it? When you look at the size of the mission, the size of the project, even though we live in a Christian society, we're a distinct minority. So you could certainly say the laborers are few, not too many care about the gospel message today. So we have a big task. The laborers are few. But what about the harvest? What is the harvest? It seems pretty clear from this passage of Scripture that the harvest is also people, right? The harvest is also people. The word harvest is used in the Bible oftentimes to speak of the judgment at the end of time. In passage like Joel 2, Revelation 14, Matthew 13, where Jesus talks about the wheat representing believers and the weeds representing unbelievers, growing together until the time of judgment when they will finally be separated. He speaks of that as a harvest. But in this passage, it's pretty clear, it's not some future end-time judgment day that Jesus is looking toward, is it? He's thinking about a harvest that's available now. He's thinking near term, not the end of the age. I think it's as Jesus is looking out on the masses and the multitudes that are following him, but not really knowing him. He's recognizing there's a harvest there. He's seeing that group. He's seeing those beyond the boundaries of Palestine. He's seeing those beyond the boundaries of his own Jewish heritage who, who are his, but they haven't come to know him yet. 
and he wants laborers to help bring them in. Turn with me to the sixth chapter of John. If you're in Luke, you just have to move over one chapter. Sixth chapter of John. John chapter six, he's gonna talk about this very subject. John six and verse 37. Jesus is talking to a group of people here and he says, all that the Father gives me, all that the Father gives me, who are those? Those are people who are gonna come to faith in Christ at some point in time. We think we do it on our own initiative. The fact is we are those who have been gifted to Christ by God the Father. He says, all that the Father has given me will come to me. And whoever comes to me, will never, I will never cast out. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life. And I will raise him up on the last day. Think about a preacher coming into town and saying that kind of stuff. I mean, that's amazing. The Father's gonna give people to me. I'm gonna raise them up on the last day. Imagine. And in this passage, we see the kind of the unexplainable mix of the sovereignty of God when he says, all that the Father gives me will come to me. That's God's sovereignty, right? But the free will of man when he says, everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him shall have eternal life. How do you put those two together? I, I don't. Neither does Jesus bother to do it here. He understands how those two fit together. But here's what we do know. The first, the sovereignty of God, guarantees the success of the mission, right? There's going to be some who come. The second, the free will of man tells us and clarifies for us that everybody is accountable. Everybody is gonna be accountable for what they did with Christ. And so as Jesus considers that, he's looking for people who will help in the harvest. He needs laborers who will help get that message out. Turn back a couple chapters to John 4. John 4. John 4 and verse 35, Jesus says, do not say there are yet four months and then comes the harvest. He was speaking there of the physical harvest that the people in Palestine would have been anticipating at that time. He says, don't say there's four months and then comes the harvest. Look, I tell you, lift up your eyes and see that the fields are white for harvest. Already the one who reaps is receiving wages and gathering fruit for eternal life so that sower and reaper may rejoice together. For here the saying holds true, one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap that for which you did not labor. Others have labored, in other words, they did the sowing, they did the cultivating, and now you're gonna to get to go out and reap. Others have labored and you have entered into their labor as you bring the gospel to them and give them an opportunity to come to Christ. The gospel is for everyone. And Jesus is saying there are gonna be some who sow, there are gonna be some who plant, there are gonna be some who water, there are gonna be some who reap. They're all together in this process. And he says, I want you to participate. He needs laborers. A class in a rural area, you know, of kids were asked this question by their teacher. Teacher said there are 100 sheep in this sheepfold. Five leave the sheepfold. How many are left? And she calls on Johnny. She says, Johnny, do you know the answer to that question? And Johnny says, there are not gonna be any left. The teacher says, Johnny, surely you know your math. 100 minus five is 95. And he says, well, teacher, you may know math, but I know sheep. And he said, if one's gone, they're all gone. <laughs> How many left? And you see, beloved, that's what Jesus is seeing when he, when he gives this message. He sees a harvest of lost individuals blindly following one another like sheep to the slaughter. And he's saying, I need some laborers who are going to Give the gospel to these who have not heard 
or do not know or at least have not responded to help bring them in. So that's the challenge of the commission. Huge harvest out there. Needs to be addressed. Not enough people to go around. So what's the command? Two of them Jesus gives in this passage. Two commands. And if you want to get an idea how important these commands are, you need only look at Matthew 25. Don't turn there, but I'm going to read for you a passage there. In Matthew 25, Jesus really gives us a challenge to share the gospel with those who have not seen and have not heard, haven't had a chance. And he wants to share the passion of his heart. And he reminds us in Matthew 25, look, I, you know, it could be as simple as just giving a cup of cold water to anyone in my name. By doing that, you can be sharing who Christ is. But listen to what he says if you choose not to do that. If we are unfaithful to this task. Here's what he says in, in Matthew 25, verse 46. He says, and these, that is those who fail to give the cup of water, that is those who fail to reach out to a lost world. He said, and these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. What's Jesus saying there? What he's saying there, beloved, is that if you really belong to him, you will not only want to be part of sharing him with the world, but you will be in some way part of sharing him with the world. He doesn't really leave any middle ground there. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. John Piper says this about that passage of scripture. I think it's very instructive. He says, I need to hear this message again and again because I drift into a peacetime mindset. See if this relates to you. I drift into a peacetime mindset as certainly as rain falls down and flames go up. I am wired by nature to love the same toys that the world loves. I start to fit in. I start to love what others love. I start to call earth home. Before you know it, I'm calling luxuries needs and using my money just the way unbelievers do. I begin to forget the war. I don't think much about people perishing. I mean, if John Piper is saying this, if any of you know John Piper's about as intense a guy as I know, he's saying, I fall into this mindset. I forget about people perishing. It's a terrible sickness. And I thank God for those who have forced me again and again toward a wartime mindset. See, Jesus is calling us, beloved, to a DEFCON 1 status because we are in a spiritual war. The affluence and the ease that we live in in our country causes us to downplay that and to forget it oftentimes. And believe me, the day is coming quickly when the sides are going to be set and there's not going to be the same kind of opportunity we have as we do now to just kind of float along. I don't know if you watched the news this week, but did you see in the city of Houston where they've passed resolutions for civil rights to, de to defend the rights of homosexuals and transsexuals? The mayor has now subpoenaed all of the sermons of the pastors in the city of Houston to find out, are they in disobedience to this law? And not only that, she has also subpoenaed all of their private correspondence, their emails, their text messages, and everything else. The war is on, beloved, and the sides are going to be set. And we have to determine, do we love Christ or do we love this world? And what does our life show about what we love? The battle is raging and the harvest is white. And Jesus says, I need some laborers. And he says, if I've got some, it's because they love me and want me. If they don't, it's probably because they're not mine. So what are the commands? Two simple commands that he gives here. The first one is fascinating, I think, because it is so unexpected. I mean, think about it. He's just said in verse two, the, the harvest is plentiful, the laborers are few. So what would you expect next? 
You'd expect, okay, guys, come on, saddle up, let's go. Let's get a move on. Got to get going. It's imperative that we get on the trail and get the message out there. That's what you would expect, right? Instead, what do we get? Pray. Pray earnestly. The first thing I want you to do, because the task is so big and the laborers are few, the first thing I want you to do is pray. Before you do anything else, I want you to pray. Now, I don't know about you, but that seems a little strange to me in a, from another sense as well, because this is God's harvest, isn't it? It's the Lord's harvest. The Lord already knows that the laborers are few because he's telling us that the laborers are few. So why in the world do I need to pray? Certainly my prayer is not gonna enlighten him about something he doesn't know, right? So why pray? I think at least two reasons, there's probably more, but the, the first one is because God not only ordains the end results of things, he also ordains the means. And prayer is a means to make something happen. And that thing will happen if we pray. It won't happen if we don't because God has ordained that we pray. So if we're not praying, we're disobeying the command that he's given us. So that alone would be enough reason to pray. But the second thing is when we pray, it's not so much about us moving God. It's always, prayer is always about, we, we, we mistake prayer so much. Prayer is always about us aligning with God. And what God is trying to do here is get us to get in sync with his great heart of compassion. He's trying to make his vision become ours. He's trying to make his passion become ours. He's trying to make his heart become ours. And he knows if we're praying about this, that that'll be true. Now note also that he doesn't say, pray for those lost people. He doesn't say that. Now, we should do that. We have examples in Scripture of that. Paul says in Romans 10.1, he says, Brothers, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel, for them, is that they would be saved. Paul's praying for people, and we should be praying for people by name, with compassion, with urgency. Listen, let me put it this way. If you don't have a friend, neighbor, loved one, family member, or a group of them that you're praying for who don't know the Lord, something's wrong. We need to be praying for people. But in this passage, his emphasis is what? He instructs us to pray that the Lord will send out more laborers. That's not something we pray for very often, is it? It's not something we pray for. We kind of look at the world and we look at the size of the task and we kind of say, whoa, that's overwhelming. Can't ever get that done. And at the very, probably the most we do is say, how do you, save seven billion people one at a time and so I'll work on the one in my neighbor. That's good. But you see what the Lord wants us to do is catch a vision. No, it's, it's all of them who need salvation. And so let's pray that the Lord will send out laborers. Let's join in where his heart is. And beloved, if we pray, he will answer. If we pray, he will answer. Lyman well, Jewett was a missionary back in the middle of the 19th century. He'd been out in India for 17 years, had seen very little fruit to his ministry. In fact, his mission, sta station, his mission board had called his station, they'd named it Forlorn Hope. That was the name of the place they'd given it and they were about to pull the plug. They wanted him to come home, didn't think it was worthwhile. So on New Year's Day in 1854, he gathered a bunch of his helpers and they went up on top of a, of a hillside there and they prayed. Jewett read them this passage that, that Jesse's already read for us from Isaiah 52. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news who proclaims peace, who brings glad tidings of good things, who proclaims salvation, who says to Zion, your God reigns. And then they prayed. They prayed for someone with beautiful feet who could come and open doors that hadn't been able to be opened in this barren field. And then they came back often to this, what they began to call prayer meeting hill, 
10 years later, 10 years later in God's timing, we'd have done it sooner, right? But in God's timing, 10 years later, a young farmer in Iowa named John Clough was harvesting wheat. And the news came that he was received into the mission by the mission board that he had applied to and that they wanted him to go to a place called Forlorn Hope. Rather than take it as a bad sign, he went determined to do the best he could to bring the gospel to this place that had this name. And he went and he began to share Christ with anybody who would listen. He began to pray for results. And he got results. He got famine and he got drought. Do you ever pray and get results like that? Those are the ones we don't thank God much for, right? Hard to thank God sometimes for the answer we get. But he thanked God for that answer, and then he began to work tirelessly to bring food to these people who were starving. He had resources, and he had possibilities, and he let the word be be known back in the United States, and he began to be able to bring in a lot of food and so on, and that turned out to be exactly the thing that opened the door. The Indian people in that area began to love him for the works of mercy and compassion, and then they began to respond to the message. A powerful revival swept the area. One day alone, he and his people that had come to know Christ baptized 2,222 people. Within 40 days at one point in time, almost 8,000 people came to faith in Christ. Over 20,000 during the course of his ministry there, all because somebody prayed that the Lord of the harvest would send forth laborers into the harvest. God knew exactly who to send and when to send him and how to position the ministry that he gave him there. And so, what's the first thing he commands us to do? Pray. What's the second? Second command Jesus gives. He says, I want you to pray for laborers then I want you to become the answer to your own prayer. I want you to go. I want you to pray for laborers, but then I want you to be a partial answer to your own prayer. I want you to go. Verse three, go. Pray and go. Go your way. Behold, I am sending you. There's a great principle here. I would state it this way. God never, God never gets you in without sending you out. God never gets you in without sending you out. If you haven't been sent out or if you're not going out, the chances are it's because you haven't been in. God never takes you in without sending you out. We're keen about the getting in, right? We like that part. The idea of salvation, forgiveness, The idea of being right with God, the hope of heaven, we can all rally around that, cry, right? But please, Lord, don't ask me to talk to anybody (laughs) about my faith. We wimp out quickly at the thought of sharing our faith. Like the little boy, I I always get a kick out of this, little boy whose teacher said to him, Johnny, give me me two pronouns. And he said, who, me? And she said, that's right. That's just the way we are when Jesus says, I'm sending you out. And we say, who, me? And he says, that's right. You're the one. You're who I'm sending. I didn't call you in except to send you out. You have a mission. You have a commission. You have a job now. You have a purpose. You have a meaning. You have a commission to go. I'm sending you. Say, but Dave, I don't have the gift of evangelism. I, I, I don't have the gift of evangelism. And maybe you don't. But you know what? That's irrelevant when it comes harvest time. Did you realize that? It's irrelevant to the harvest. It's irrelevant to representing Christ. When it's time for harvest, everybody turns to. Have you noticed that? The little farm I grew up on in eastern Nebraska, when it was harvest time, everybody turned out. Kids, Grandparents, friends, neighbors, everybody came. When it was harvest time and the crop was ripe, you got it in as fast as you could, right? Nobody sat around saying, sorry, I only milk cows. Or I only do housework. Or I have to go to school. I mean, none of those flew. You got out and you helped with the 
harvest. It was all hands on board. No one could say, well, I have the gift of plowing, but I don't have the gift of harvesting. It didn't work that way. Everybody went because the harvest was on. And beloved, it's no different in the harvest of the Lord. It doesn't do to say, well, my gift is teaching. That's great. You should be teaching. But you must also be part of the harvest. My gift is administration. Great. But you need to be part of the harvest. I give so other people can go. Great. But you must go too. We must all be part of the harvest. It will not do to say, because I'm not gifted in a certain way, I can be discounted. You know, if we, if we can't tell somebody what the Lord has done in our life, the chances are it's because the Lord hasn't done anything in our life. We'll be imperfect. We're flawed. Look, I've been here... What have been here? Seven, six years, six and a half years. You, you know my flaws probably better than I do by now. I, I know some of yours. We're flawed, imperfect people, but beloved, God's put us here for a purpose. And together, we've got to be part of the harvest. Fields are wide into harvest and it's time to go. Now notice Jesus says, go your way. I love that. That's where you really get some relief here. Go your way. He doesn't say all of you go be like Nicole and Jason with Campus Crusade. He doesn't say all of you go and be a, a, a pastor like Pastor Dave. He doesn't say go and do it this way or that way. He says instead go your way. Training is great. Training helps. We ought to know how to share the gospel with somebody. I gave you four verses last week that you could share the gospel, what the Bible means with somebody. And training is great. But that's not the main thing. The main thing is simply to open your mouth and represent Jesus. Let me give you some examples. Do, do, you, do you remember the, the man that was, that was inhabited by a legion of demons in Luke 8? Remember him? And Jesus healed him. He cast the demons out, remember? And, and he says, Jesus, I want to follow you. Can I go with you? And Jesus said, no, no. no. I, got, I got people that have called to follow me in my physical journey. What I want you to do, and this is in Luke 8, 39, he said, return to your home and declare how much God has done for you. And he went away proclaiming throughout the whole city how much Jesus had done for him. Jesus brought him in and he sent him out. He didn't give him training. He didn't send him to seminary. He just said, go and tell what Jesus has done for you. And the man went and did that. How about the blind man that Jesus healed in John 9? Remember him? Blind from birth. Jesus healed him so he could see again and the man was rejoicing and then the religious leaders found out about it and they called this guy in on the carpet. And then they were guilty of leading the witness when they told him, look, give glory to God all you want. That's fine. But quit talking about Jesus. Quit saying that Jesus did this. We know he's a sinner. He doesn't even keep the Sabbath. Renounce him. Remember what the man said? Here's what he said. Whether, whether he's a sinner or not, I don't know. We do. He wasn't. But he said, one thing I do know, that though I was blind, now I see. Didn't take a seminary degree to say that. He's representing Christ. He's preparing the way. He's being faithful to the commission. Doesn't take... Great training to say, you know, I used to think I could make it on my own and then Jesus got a hold of my life and I gave my life to him and thank God he saved me. I needed a savior. We all need a savior. How much education does it take to say that? Every Christian is sent. These 72 represent all of us, just common everyday people. They're regular folks. But God never calls us in but that he sends us out. He never blesses us without the, without, the, without the understanding that we will become a blessing. What does he say? Remember how he called Abraham? Abraham, as, certainly his father was a polytheist and probably Abraham was too when God called him. He called him in. He said, Abraham, you're gonna be my guy. Your family's gonna be my family. Your nation is gonna be my nation. 
I'm going to do great things for you. He called them in. I'm going to be your God and you're going to be my man. And then what did he do? Then he sent him out. He said, I want you to go into a country that I'll show you along the way. And he said, you're not only going to be a blessing, but you will be a blessing to all the nations of the earth. He called him in and sent him out. What did, what did God do in Exodus 3 when he called Moses? Man, what an experience he gave him. He called him in, burning bush. Moses is walking through the desert, and there's a burning bush, and suddenly the bush is talking to him. Wouldn't you like to have that experience? When, you know, what a terrific thing. I've met God face to face. Wonderful. God called him in, and he gave him this wonderful experience. And then what did he do? He sent him out. He said, I want you to go down there to Egypt and deliver my people. God doesn't call us in, but he sends us out. He called Isaiah in Isaiah chapter 6, this most righteous of men, saw God high and lifted up in the temple. God called him in and gave him a vision that few people have ever seen of himself. So much so that Abraham fell, Isaiah fell like a dead man before the Lord. And he said, woe am I this most righteous of men, a man of unclean lips. And what did God do? God sent an angel with a, he didn't say, oh, Isaiah, you're good. He didn't say that. He said, you're right. So let me cleanse you. And he sent an angel with a coal of fire representing his forgiving power and cleansed his tongue and he forgave his sins and cleansed his heart. And then what? Then what? Then God said, who will go for me? What did Isaiah say? Here I am. Send me. God doesn't call us in, beloved, but he sends us out. Every Christian is on a harvest mission. Now, I want to make one more point before we're done. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians 7. 1 Corinthians 7. This is really important for you to get. Set it in general, now I want you to see it more specifically. Does that mean that we're all going to be missionaries, that we're all going to be pastors, or we're all going to be evangelists of some kind? No, it's not what it means at all. And Paul clarifies that for us in a wonderful way in this passage in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Now look at verse 17. He says, only let each person lead the life, only let each person lead the life that the Lord has assigned to him, that the Lord has assigned to him and to which God has called him. Does it say live the life that God assigned to somebody else? He says live the life that God assigned to to you. He doesn't say to the people in Corinth, live the life that God assigned to me. He says, live the life that God assigned to you. And in the context, in the context, this is all about career and calling. It's about what are you doing with your life from a secular standpoint, showing there's no differentiation in the Bible between secular and sacred. It's all one and the same to the Lord. It's all a calling. It's all an assignment. Listen, you think you chose your your assignment, you think you chose your place of work, your place of where you hang out every day. I got news for you. That's where God has called you. That's where he has assigned you. That's his ver version of it. God has assigned you there. He says, let every man, or every person lead the life that the Lord has assigned to him. Whatever God has called you to do, get on with it. That's, that's, that's exactly where God wants us to go. Now, what does he assigned us to do? If you're a farmer, to raise cattle or to raise crops, right? Or if you're a teacher, to teach those children. Or if you're a mother at home, to teach those children, to train those children. Is that what, uh, to do business deals if you're a businessman? Is that what God's called you to do? Yes, but not primarily. Not primarily. Primarily, you're there to represent Christ. Primarily, you're there to prepare the way Paul makes that really clear at the end of the section. Look at verse 24. So, brothers and sisters, in whatever condition each was called, whatever your career, whatever your status in life, there let him or her remain with God. 
representing God. Doing what you do by and for Him. You're part of the harvest crew. So get on with it. Represent Him as best you can in whatever way you can. I'll tell you what, the more you're working at this, the more you're probably going to be praying for more laborers to get in the harvest, right? Because you realize you need help and that others need help and that there's a harvest out there white. Listen, let me, let me give you let me give you an example of this. It's an amazing example. Some of you have probably heard of the Moravians. The Moravians were uh, a group in Germany in the 19th century who became really on fire for the Lord, and they were some of the earliest of all missionaries. They had a tremendous missionary spirit, tremendous heart for missions. Two of these young men, two young Moravians, somehow got a burden on their heart for an island in the West Indies. When they began to investigate, they found out that the island was, that there was a British guy that owned the whole island. He had a bunch of slave labor out there to uh, produce whatever crops it was that he was producing. And when they approached him, he would not allow any minister or missionary to go out there and work. He was afraid that would goof up his slaves, and he wasn't going to have that among them. So they did the um, absolutely unthinkable because they knew they'd been commissioned. They sold themselves to him. They sold themselves to that man. And with the money that they got for selling themselves, they paid their way to go to the West Indies. They sold themselves into a lifetime of slavery because it was the only way they could go to the harvest that they knew God had called them to. And as their family and friends came to see them away on the boat that was leaving Hamburg, one of them cried out this. He said, may the lamb that was slain receive the reward of his sufferings. May the lamb that was slain received the reward of his suffering. He wasn't worried about his own sufferings. He was worried about the sufferings of Christ. And if Christ had suffered for those people, they ought to at least have an opportunity to have the forgiveness that he offers. Don't you think? That kind of became the rallying cry for the Moravian missions. Beloved, it's the only reason we're here to be part of the harvest. We need to be part of the harvest crew. Is it possible that God is missing in someone's life that we know? Because we haven't been faithful. So what do we do? We pray and we go. So let's pray. Father, thank you for this challenge. It's a tremendous challenge to my own life. Lord, I thank you. I, I'm so thankful that you've, uh, for surrounding me with a group of people who I know love you, and I, whom I know are anxious to obey you. <clears throat> and Lord, I pray that this particular challenge to really address the harvest that's out there of people who don't know you by praying and then by going, by living Christ or letting Christ live through us, in the career to which you've called us, in the, the status, into the position in life to which you've called us. Help us to do it faithfully so that God isn't missing because of our unfaithfulness. Give us your vision, Father. Give us your passion, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you please stand with me as we sing together this closing hymn?